Hello, my name is Megan Yannick. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at NC State University. And today I'm going to be discussing Municipal Solid Waste Collection Process Model Overview. Quick overview of what we're going to do today. Uh, give you an overview of the collection process model. Go through some example equations. Discuss our data development and provide some illustrative results. So the collection process model is used to estimate costs and energy use for the collection of municipal solid waste. The user defines a number of inputs for their collection scheme, their collection sector, including things like waste composition and generation, the schedule of collection services and types of services offered, the fuel type and efficiency of the collection vehicles, and so on. Uh, along with that, there is a specified amount of incoming municipal solid waste. And from the user inputs, the collection process model calculates the direct emissions from fuel combustion, electricity used, and cost associated with the user-defined collection area. This slide illustrates the process flow for collection and the system boundary. So uh, different from some of the other processes that are included in the S-Wolf model, collection is somewhat simple in that all of the waste coming in goes out in the same form. There's no transformation of the mass. Basically, we have one ton of waste collected and one ton of waste delivered to a treatment, disposal, or transfer facility. Um, along the way, there is energy going in that includes uh, collection vehicle fuel and emissions coming out. So the different types of collection uh, services offered include uh, residual waste collection or mixed waste collection, uh, separate recyclables collection, leaf vacuum, separate yard waste collection, and so on. And each of the different waste services will collect a particular waste stream and take it to one or more of the disposal, treatment, or transfer facilities, such as a landfill, a material recovery facility, a composting facility, and so on. The model is broken up into three types of collection sectors, which include single-family residential, multi-family residential, and commercial. For each sector that the user wants to analyze, uh, he'll define inputs for each sector, including what the type is, uh, the population of the area, and how many stops there are, such as the number of houses or buildings for a commercial sector, uh, what is the waste generation and composition for each one, the types of collection services, such as residual and recyclables collection, and where those waste streams collected are going to be taken to, such as a treatment or disposal facility. This slide provides an illustration of a sample collection scheme with three collection sectors, one single family, one multifamily, and one commercial sector uh, within an, a collection area. And we'll zoom in on the single family sector. So we have a single family sector that offers three collection services, residual waste, uh, single stream recyclables and yard waste and each of those waste streams is taken to a disposal or treatment facility the residual waste taken to a landfill and that is called a collection process the combination of the waste service and the disposal or treatment facility the single stream recyclables are taken to a single stream MRF and the yard waste is taken to a composting facility so again, the waste stream collected by each collection service could be sent to one destination, such as all going to one landfill, or it could be taken to more destinations if, for example, some recyclables were taken to one MRF and some recyclables were taken to another MRF or something of that nature. This is our sample solid waste management system that gives you an idea of uh, the collection 
that we have going on, in this case we are calling it commingle recyclables or single string recyclables, uh, residual waste collection and organics collection. And from this diagram you can see that it is possible for the different waste streams to be taken to more than one single facility uh, within the model. Whether or not that makes sense in an actual scenario is another question, but the model is able to do that. So we're going to discuss the different waste streams and where they can be taken to, and this is basically what the model allows to happen. So in this case, we are talking about the waste that can be sent to a landfill, thermal waste to energy or incineration, or to a mixed waste MRF. So in this case, we're talking about uh, the mixed waste and residual waste, which really are about the same thing. Uh, the distinction is that residual waste is what's left after some separate collection is done, such as re recyclables or organics. So each of these waste streams could be taken to a landfill, a mixed waste MRF, or waste to energy. This slide shows which waste streams are sent to different types of MRFs, material recovery facilities. Uh, so our single stream recyclables or a separate dry waste collection would be sent to a single stream MRF. Uh, dual stream recyclables, uh, such as containers separated from paper or fiber, would be taken to a dual stream MRF. And pre-sorted recyclables are taken to a pre-sorted MRF. Pretty self-explanatory. This slide shows which waste streams are sent to a landfill, anaerobic di digestion, thermal waste energy, or to a composting facility. Um, in this case, we have leaf vacuum, yard waste, or source-separated organics, or wet waste. And I'll point out that uh, the not all of these waste services are offered to all sectors, so the second column discusses which sectors are serviced by these waste um, services. Going back to our sample collection scheme, uh, again, one single family, one multifamily, and one commercial sector. So we've talked about the collection services and where each service can be taken um, and the collection sectors. So now we're going to discuss inputs for each collection process, that is a collection service and a collection destination, the user is able to define a set of input parameters. So basically going into the model, the user will have uh, all of these input values um, with a set of defaults that we've provided in the model. Uh, but you can go in and review all the defaults and change them according to your own needs and to the system that you want to analyze. So a few of the inputs that uh, are included in the model include participation rate, how many houses in the sector actually participate in yard waste collection, maybe only half or maybe 90%. If you have that information, you can uh, assign a number to that parameter. The uh, collection frequency at each stop, meaning how many times per week, typically one time per week, maybe two times per week. Um, the distance and travel times between the garage and the collection route, the collection route and the destination. The distance and times between collection stops, loading, time at a service stop, um, how long the drivers take for a break, the volume of the collection vehicle, the waste density, utilization factor, and basically that means how full is the truck when you unload it on average, efficiency of the vehicle, and cost parameters. So again, the user will have uh, defaults provided in the model and can go through and change these based on their own system that they want to analyze. So once the user's gone through and defined, it, defined all the inputs for the collection scheme, uh, the model will then compute a number of outputs. So there are four primary outputs, which are the number of collection vehicles, the cost per mass of waste collected, the fuel use per uh, ton of waste, and the electricity used per ton of waste. We're going to talk about a few sample calculations uh, to give you an idea of what happens in the model. 
So going through our four primary outputs, or a few of our primary outputs, the number of trucks is defined by the number of stops, the frequency of collection, and that's divided by the number of working days per week, such as five days per week, multiplied by the number of stops per trip, and the number of trips per day vehicle. So three of those are calculated values or intermediate calculations, and two of them are directly input by the user. So going on to the number of stops, that's simply the participation rate times the total number of possible stops in the sector, and those both would be input by the user. And the number of trips per day vehicle is calculated using the time parameters for travel times, working hours per day, the number and length of breaks, um, and the unloading time at the transfer facility or uh, treatment or disposal facility. So once those intermediate values are calculated, the number of trucks is found for the collection sector. And the last one is the houses per trip. So that's going to be found by the specified waste generation rate, the amount of waste per stop per collection, and the capacity of the truck, the utilization factor, and the density of the waste stream. So that for that we're going to use some assumed density inside the truck. Once we found uh, once we found that, we'll also go on to find the fuel use per ton of waste collection. So the total fuel use is going to be the total fuel used per day vehicle divided by the total mass per day vehicle. Uh, we'll find the total mass per day vehicle by multiplying the house, houses per trips times the number of trips per day vehicle times the amount of waste at each stop. At each stop. So those were all discussed just before. The amount of fuel is going to be found by summing up the different, uh, f the different segments and how much fuel is used for each segment. So the distance between the collection route and the facility divided by the fuel efficiency for that segment. Um, sometimes we might just have the overall fuel efficiency such as all of our collection trucks for all segments of collection get two and a half miles per gallon. Well, we can also just use an overall average fuel use to calculate this, but if uh, there is data available for the different, different types of fuel efficiencies during different modes of operation, uh, the model is able to uh, calculate that with a little more, um, with more inputs provided. So those were a few calculations and discussions of the different inputs. Uh, I'll talk briefly about data development. So we were able to get data from different municipalities and some waste management organizations, including transit times, um, times and distance between stops, time at each collection stop, how long it took to unload at a processing or disposal or transfer facility, and the fuel consumption uh, during an average uh, truck operation and during different modes of operation. We also observed some ac collection activities locally. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the cities, A through E we've called them, what type of uh, disposal facility they utilized, their approximate population density, and what data we were uh, able to obtain from those cities, including fuel consumption and tonnages, route distances and times uh, from city B GPS tracking data, fuel consumption, um, excuse me, engine control modules were records were provided for city D that gave us uh, a lot of operating hours and fuel efficiency for that for uh, that city and City E provided some tip times at a MRF and a landfill and transfer station. So for our collection route parameters, uh, we have some time inputs in the model, including the stop duration, the time it took at each collection stop. So along the x-axis, we show the city, the type of waste collected, and the uh, type of truck, automated or semi-automated, and along the y-axis is the time, 
So this chart just shows the median as the center bar inside the box. That's the median of all of the time data. And the bottom and top of the box are the 25th and 75th percentile of the data. So this just shows uh, the data distribution about how long it took at each stop. Um, and from this, we, we used these values in our inputs for some of our sample analyses. The next chart is very similar. This just shows the time between each stop. And of course, this would only be um, applicable for a, a similar city uh, A or city B that was a similar distance between houses. And all of this data was collected for a single family residential um, collection sector. From all the data that we got, uh, this chart aggregates the average diesel fuel efficiency miles per gallon along the y-axis and along the x-axis the city and the type of collection. So for residual waste somewhere around two miles per gallon and similarly for recyclables about the same. So uh, not a significant difference for these uh, cities and collection sectors. City D, I mentioned we got engine control module records, so for over 100,000 hours of a number of collection vehicle operation, uh, we broke down the fuel use and the time spent during driving and during idling. So the way the reports were for this data, uh, idling is less than 1.8 miles per hour. Um, so the fuel used during driving uh, was almost 80% and less was used during idling, only about less than a quarter. And uh, time spent driving was about 60%. So uh, you can see the different distribution here. Uh, this chart shows some of the tip durations for City E for a MRF landfill and transfer station. And from this, we, we uh, use this to draw some uh, tip times, time spent at unloading uh, to use as input in the model. So combining our input parameters with the data development that we had from some real world uh, observations and uh, information provided to us, we did a few sample analysis analyses. So in on this slide, we use the model to calculate the fuel use based on a, a city that was somewhat like city A and city B. And after computing the fuel use, we compared it with the operational values that we had for those cities. So for residual waste, you can see uh, the model somewhat un under predict, um, excuse me, over predicted. And for recyclables, it was over predicted for city A and under predicted for city B. Uh, so the results demonstrate that the model functions, um, but it's also really important to refine the model with uh, uh, accurate input parameters to get a good estimate of uh, fuel use. We also did a sample analysis for environmental impacts. So since our model is able to sum up the life cycle emissions, resulting from collection vehicle fuel use. Uh, what we did was compared a, our sample cities A and B with a city that had converted to compressed natural gas vehicles. And for the compressed natural gas vehicles, we assumed an energy penalty of 15%. So what that means is the, uh, it was assumed that about 15% lower fuel economy in terms of diesel gallon equivalent than the comparable uh, fuel economy for the diesel vehicles. And using these emissions factors that we developed that were developed from EcoInvent database, uh, we calculated the global warming potential. So this slide just illustrates the operational value, uh, which is simply the quantity of fuel reported to be used times the emissions parameters that I just mentioned, um, as well as the model predicted global warming potential for a diesel system and for a compressed natural gas system. 
And lastly, we use the model to demonstrate some the sensitivity to certain inputs. So we varied the some of the input parameters through a range of values and showed how the model responded uh, to that. The idea here is that um, if you know in a certain range the model varies significantly, uh, then it would be more important to have a really accurate value, as, as accurate as possible, uh, to use for your inputs. So you can see the, the time spent at the unloading facility is, the, is represented by the green triangles, the second line from the bottom all the way on the right. What you can see here is that the time spent at the facility almost has very little impact on the overall global warming potential. The line is almost horizontal. On the other hand, the distance between the route, the collection route, and the facility does have some impact. Uh, for example, if it's 10 miles versus 30 miles, uh, there is m more of a difference in the global warming potential. So knowing the actual distance would would make an uh, would make a difference on your um, on your results. Also, this is a, a value that's actually easy to measure, so it, it should be something that you can find the value, plug it into your model, and uh, improve your results. So our collection model is bottom-up, which means we can specify values for all different kinds of parameters, uh, some of which we discussed briefly today. And it can predict fuel use, energy use, the associated emissions with those, uh, with that energy use, and also select environmental impacts. Uh, our model predicted fuel use for the representative cities was within about 5 to 45 percent of the operational values that were reported to us from those operational uh, collection routes. Different collection scenarios can be created to compare environmental implication of implications of changing inputs, and we briefly talked about uh, model sensitivity to a few of the input parameters. The, uh, the model allows us to do what-if analyses of future collection scenarios, and also integrated analyses using SWOLF, which you'll, you can hear about from other presenters uh, discussing the other process models within the SWOLF model. Uh, we have a default data set that was developed for operational data and lastly our collection model results for fuel efficiency were paired with appropriate emissions coefficients to compute emissions and enable impact assessments. So I hope you uh, learned something about the collection model today and um, how it can be used to analyze your collection scenarios and you can learn more about the other process models within the Solid Waste Optimization Lifecycle Framework or SWOLF model uh, from our other presenters. Thank you.